Hey, what we are starting a, a brand new series called You Plus Me Equals Church. And, uh, and I love that because we've already seen that in operation that the church is not merely a building, it is a people. It is a people and uh, a people who love Jesus and who are supporting one another using the gifts, the talents, the resources that they have to not just love God, but to bless, serve, minister, build up, encourage um, the brothers and sisters. You and I are recipients of other people being the church. And so we see that musically on the stage. And I just think, thank God there are people in our church who can provide a harmony, <laughs> harmonious voices. I'm like, I cannot do that. Thank God that Jesus brings a diversity of people into a community to be the church, to be able to bless each other in different ways. Because if the church was just Sam clones, um, uh, it wouldn't be a very fun place to be. Well, maybe it would be fun, because I try and be fun, but it, would be, it wouldn't be a good sounding one, perhaps. Um, and certainly the food wouldn't be as good. And so thank God that, that He's brought us together as a community. Um, and so my first point, can I jump straight in today? Is that all right? Yeah. We're here for a, a good time? Not a long time. Someone's with me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> point number one, we don't just go to church. We are the church. We do go to church. Don't get me wrong. Gathering together is essential for believers. The premise of my message today is that we are family. Family is communal, it's relational, it's social, it's fully integrated in a way that is quite unique and rare and increasingly so in our Western society where people are becoming more isolated, more in love with their own practices, processes, preferences. Um, and, and so because of that, people are more independent than they've ever been in human history. Are you aware of that, the time that we're living in? It's actually um, providing huge implications to our mental health services, our actual physical health services. But just as a society as a whole, this is a really tricky thing and a really problematic thing. So we are to be a uniquely connected as the people of God. So we gather together, as it says in Hebrews. Um, it says, don't neglect meeting together. Gather together as often as you can. But we don't just go to church. We are... The church, isn't that, isn't that good news that when the preacher preaches too long or when the musicians are singing a little flat in other churches, not in here, <laughs> that was phenomenal. Um, if the food is not that good, if, if, if things are a bit clunky and the service falls flat, isn't it good is that our gatherings does not make the church. That that is not the, the end goal. Gathering has a purpose, a primary purpose, that, an essential purpose, but that's not the church. We are the church. And I just think, I think that's good. And, and you know, what we naturally do as, as people, and term, I don't want to nitpick terminology because I think that's limited, but, but we sometimes we think how, you know, people say, how was church? And they're talking about the church services. Um, they're not proclaiming heresy. But the, how, how was church? And say, you know, you think about the things, how we often answer that. Um, is, you know, this was good. You know, the preacher went too long. Um, the, the preacher was very handsome today. And, and it was, so we, we talk about some of the elements of the service. But you know what I love? When, when people ask me about the church, and because that's my profession, I'm a professional Christian, um, and, and people say, how's, how's church going? And I, do you know how I answer it? I say, there are amazing people in our church. That's how I answer it to do with people because that's what it is. It's a community of people. And so the strength and how is church is very dependent on how you're going, how your walk is going with Jesus, how we are relating to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ how you are actually taking and being led by the Holy Spirit in your workplaces, in your family life, that is a reflection of how the church is going. 
You reflect how the church is going. And I'm so blessed that when new people and guests, and if you're a guest today, I trust that you've already felt a hospitable welcome, um, that this is an environment where you can, regardless of where you are on your spiritual journey, that you can come and you can feel like a part of family. But it's like, I'm so blessed. I'm like, this is an amazing community. There are people who are really following Jesus well. How's the church going? It's going, there's some really good stuff there. Church is going well. And I think sometimes we just need to be careful. And I don't wanna labour this point because I think on one level it's, a, it's an obvious one. But as we talk about the church, we just need to be really careful to not be coming at it in, in a consumerist type of way. Where, where we're not thinking and measuring and participating in a way that it's like, how, how has it served me today? How has the service met my needs and my preferences? Oh, you know, but we, we don't have many hymns at the 10.30 service, Sam. I know what's going on with that. Well, last week we did and it was amazing. <laughs> but here's the thing, here's the thing. Often that kind of thinking and sometimes even that kind of grumbling and criticisms come more out of personal preference than out of biblical conviction. Mm. And, and we need to be so careful that we're, we've not, in our following of Jesus, we're not actually approaching it and our mindset is consumeristic of how is this blessing me? How, what am I actually, you know, when I'm doing the sums, am I, I wanna be getting more out of it than I'm putting in. What is it? Like that's transactional. When we are the church is relational. And so there are times, oh, this is, this is hurtful. There are times when we're actually gonna be sowing in a lot more than we're perhaps feeling like we're getting out. I will qualify it and say, it needs to be reciprocal. So I need to be blessed. Being part of the body is like, I'm being served, I'm being blessed. But that's not where my primary, primary my thinking is, because that's consumerist. But I'm like, we need to be building each other up. I need to be gaining, I need to be being built up and encouraged, and that's why we need to be, be, everyone needs to be active in what they're doing, coming, bringing something, contributing something. But it's like, I can't just be thinking about what it's doing for me. Oh, you know, the, um, I'm trying to think of an example to criticise, but yeah, I just can't, you know, it's perfect. Um, <laughs> you know, the pastor at the other church, he wears a suit every week when he preaches. And it must be somewhere in the Bible where it says that. It doesn't, by the way. Um, I'm gonna go to that church because that, that's, I feel more holy there. And so we can, but I'll make a joke of it, but we can actually, the grass is greener thinking or like we can, we can be critical in our thinking, which is actually comes from a consumerist mindset and approach when really you notice people who have been a part of the local community committed for a long time, what are they doing? They're giving faithfully. They are contributing beautifully. And as, as, as they do that, they too get sewn into in all sorts of ways. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm, I need, does anyone wanna hear a scripture? Yes. Praise the Lord. I realise I've only got a short amount of time. We don't just go to church. We are the church. The church building that the Bible talks about is kind of a human church. If you can think of a human, human building. Let's read it together in 1 Peter 2. It sounds strange. As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, picking up on that construction language, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, everyone turn to the person and say, next to you and say, you. <laughs> you also, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house. So we, it's that language of you and I really are the church, part, not bricks and mortar like in the Old Testament, Old Covenant. Um, the Jerusalem temple was the centrepiece and, and really the focal point of, of true worship of Yahweh. But now it's saying through Jesus, Jesus has come as a game changer. Now, not only has He forgiven you, but He's also reconciled you as you've believed and received, repented, that you are now right with God and you also now have the Holy Spirit. 
So just as God dwelt in the temple and the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God was in there, now through you as an individual, but also it's talking about living stones being built together. So you as an individual, but collectively, now we house the very presence of God. The Holy Spirit lives in us to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I love this quote about the church. It says this, where Christ is truly preached, there is the gospel. And we don't equivocate on the gospel and how we are to be made right with God. And where the gospel is truly believed, there is the church. True believers, not just people who are sort of wanting to put up, slap up a, a religious veneer, but people who have really turned their life over to God, have been saved by grace through faith in Christ. The Easter story is when people go under the waters of baptism, which is through, throughout Christian history was the marker of being a believer of being initiated into the people of God, of saying there, there was no sense of people not being baptised once they believed. Everyone did it. And, uh, and so they were, they were baptised and saying, the old life, the old way of doing things is gone and now I have new life in Christ, a profession of belief in Him. And then it's almost like an initiation um, into the local church of God. I love this other quote from Billy, Billy Sunday. Um, and this is, I'll just preface this. If you're a visitor here, um, and this is the beautiful thing about our services is that they're open. You can inquire, you could check out things of the Christian faith. You can be interested in Jesus and you can be open without fully being across the line yet. We hope that you will embrace um, Jesus, but um, we're, there are also a, a myriad of different people as part of our family. Billy Sunday says this, Go, merely going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you an automobile. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but there, it's, it's a truism, but it, it's true and it's a great reminder, isn't it, that, that just God's not merely after attendance. He's after a surrendered life. He's after repentance. He's after devotion and loyalty, not, not earning ourselves into right relationship with God. We know that's Christianity 101. It's only by grace. Jesus' perfect life, sacrificial life on our behalf, His death, becomes ours. And, and we say, I think this is the point I was trying to make with baptism, which I didn't, which I sort of stumbled over, was it saying, I'm identifying. That is the, what happened at the Easter story is my story. Co-crucified with Christ. So we can't just attend. Let's not fool ourselves. It's much more. It is believing and it's walking in God and it's being a part of His family. It's my second point. The church of God, the church of God is God's family. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. Just so you know that it's not me making it up. So now Gentiles, and I love this beautiful, intimate, embraceive and inclusive language, keeping in mind how things were in the old covenant. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners, that is outsiders. You are citizens along with all God's holy people. You are now members of God's what? Family. You're in God's family. For those who believe have the right to become children of God. We are family so that if we are family, that means God is our Father. But then other people who believe in Christ and are in Christ then become your siblings. And that's why we call each other brothers and sisters. Hey, bro, brother from another mother, but the same spiritual father, praise the Lord. <laughs> You get, you get the good stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't, I haven't given this stuff to the Friday or the 8 8.30 a.m. service. This is fresh. <laughs> um, in the, because we talked about, who, who remembers some of Pastor Bill's fantastic sermons on, on um, the church? He's written a book on it. 
Um, The Church We Can Be. If you haven't read it, go and read it. The Leader I Can Be, so good. But he talks about those, those three picture, biblical illustrations or pictures, images of, of the church and how, what that means for us distinctively. So there's the one that I really love and I, I really love the one where it's like the church is the army. Put on the whole armour of God. Um, you know, enter into spiritual warfare. Stand. Um, pray in the Spirit. And, and it's, so it's like that beautiful picture that Christianity in a relationship with God is not a passive thing. It's where we're joining joining our, um, what's it called? Our shields together, like that picture of like Roman warfare, joining our shields together and marching forward and uh, advancing God's kingdom. So there's that beautiful picture of like, hey, come on, let's not just, let's not just be monkish about our Christianity. Let's get out there into the world, make a difference. So there's the, that picture of um, the church is God's army, Army of God. And then there's um, the, the body illustration that with Christ as the head, which I love. It was like we always need it. No matter what happens, no matter what we're doing, be Christ-centric. St- stay, it's all about Christ. He is the centre point, but also the head. as just like the cerebral function of our bodies leads and gives direction where nothing actually goes right if there's a severance from the head and, and the central nervous system. So Jesus is that. We've got general Jesus. We've got central nervous sent to Jesus, and then we've got the, the picture of the bride. I, lo- I love that. I love being married. Anyone love being married? Come on. I feel like sometimes I use my marriage illustrations in negative ways, <laughs> but today I'm talking so, but I love it. Because there's this picture, right? And in Ephesians 4 and 5, it talks about that Jesus Christ laying His life down for the church, His bride. And it's in that same language that we use Um, in a wedding ceremony of forsaking all others. So it's this beautiful picture of loyalty, of um, purity, of devotion and commitment. And also the I word, intimacy. Intimacy, that is like walking closely together, which dismisses any picture of like a God out there and me taking some religious precepts and then just merely willing them into my world. It's like, no, we need to walk and talk, spend time in the presence, be close to God. He wants intimate relationship with with us. And anything that seeks to get those little foxes that it talks about in the Bible that would seek to undermine, dilute and corrupt the intimacy we have with Jesus, those things need to be severed. We need to make a decision. I, I wanna be pure. I wanna be a pure bride for the King. Amen. So there's these three pictures, but the best one that I've saved for today is the family picture. Sons and daughters, children of God. The Bible talks about it all the time. In fact, the Apostle Paul uses the term 130 times in the New Testament. So it's, and I like Pastor Bill's other ones, but this is the primary one because this is the one that, the language that gets used the most to identify Christians Brethren, that word brethren is, is brothers, and, but it incorporates brothers and sisters and it's this picture of like siblings. And that, the word, I haven't, I haven't got it, I've got it somewhere on my phone, I haven't got it in my notes, but, but the, in the original language, um, the word brethren, it encapsulates probably best from the same womb. Like that, that's like literally what the word means, so from the same womb. And I just thought, man, that, isn't that rich? that no matter where we've come from, no matter what our past is, no matter what part of the world we're from, we, the womb that we've come from is Christ, that we are reborn in Christ, that we were dead in our sins, but we've been alive through His perfect life, death and resurrection, and now we have rebirth. And so how do we get into the family of God? Not like the rich young ruler of trying to get it all right in his perfect moral record, We can't earn our way into the family of God. The only way we can get into the family of God is through being reborn in Christ. That story of Nicodemus, who was, he was more religious than any of you. He was more upright. He was, he tried harder. He was more consistent, more faithful. He was one of the top leaders religiously. And when Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. 
To enter the family of God, you can only be reborn. So what is it, why is that significant? And you've heard that all before. And you're like, Sam, I know this stuff. This is basic. But here's the thing about Nicodemus. What Jesus was saying to Nicodemus about entering God's family is that in our lives, we, we work for God. We try and do the right thing, don't we? We try and be mostly good people. And, and I guess we build up some sort of a reputation. And if you were to look at it mathematically on paper, we're like, I'm trying to work out, you know, have a, I've done more good things than not good things. And Nicodemus had, had a fantastic record, but he was still a sinner. And so he still couldn't be reconciled to God. So he still had a problem. And here's the thing, he had, he had a whole life built around those things. And Jesus said, when using the, the terminology of becoming a baby again, it's like you, you lose all your life's work of trying to prove yourself worthy. A baby has no previous moral record. A baby contributes nothing. A baby, a baby has none of that to hold on to. So Jesus is saying, Nicodemus, in order for you to be in the family of God, you've got to be a little baby. You've got to contribute nothing. You've got to humble yourself. You've let it, got to let go of all that stuff and start again in Christ. Therefore, you, Nicodemus, are exactly the same as the adulterous woman. You, it's a level playing field. You're both babies in the kingdom of God. And so now do you see why people don't want to become born again? Because Nicodemus, Nicodemus previously can, can be sitting over here with his Jewish dress. Oh, that's my terminology for it. And he can actually compare himself to the adulterous woman. He can think, I am doing pretty good. I, I am actually legitimately on paper, I'm doing pretty good. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I've got a different way of operating. You need to be born again to get into my family. And if that's you today, and many of you, you're like, you know this stuff. This is Christianity one-on-one. But it's a good reminder of what, what it's, the kingdom of God is all about. And for you, if you're like, here, oh, I wanna be a part of the family of God, you can be today. You can take communion with the rest of the believers today if you just say, Lord, I... I give up my life. I give you my life today. I accept and believe that who, um, who you are and who you said you to be and what you did on the cross, it was for me. I received that today. You can do that today. And you can become, come into the family of God, receiving all its benefits as God, as your Father, brothers and sisters who are gonna serve you, gonna love you, gonna care for you. Amen. Praise the Lord. You should see how long my notes are and how much I'm not gonna get through. <laughs> okay, what kind of family is the church to be? Let's get practical. Acts 2, let's look at the example of the first Christian family in the early church. In Acts 2, they devote, take care of the language. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So take care of the actions that they're doing as a response. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching but they also devoted themselves to fellowship. Everyone say fellowship. fellowship. All the fellas on a ship. <laughs> fellowship is more than hanging out. It's deep union with each other. It's being family, it's being close family. And so what is the kind of family that God designed the church to be? Number one, a close family. I wonder, just as the early church was devoted to fellowship. Could you, when you look at your relationships with your church family, with your brothers and sisters, here in this local church, but not just in this local church, can it be said of you that you're devoted to fellowship? Or is perhaps um, more of a sporadic commitment term more appropriate? And so I wanted to leave that in and say, what would your life look like what would your week and your timetable look like if truly you rearranged the parts, the pieces and the priorities so that you could devote yourself not just to the, the preaching and the teaching and the accessing the podcast and the reading the Bible and all that word stuff, but it's like, what would it look like for you to devote yourself to Christian relationships with God's family? Spending time together, encouraging one another, serving, loving. And this is what we're looking at in the next two weeks. We've got it, next week is called Love Does One. There's these love acts. And then we're gonna look, look at Love Does Two, which believe it or not, is about loving one another as well. So they were devoted 
to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. I'm gonna try and get through this service without preaching about koinonia, koinonia, koinonia. I still don't know how to say it. Thank you, Pastor Chris. Thank God for multi-ethnic community with the Greeks who can actually speak Greek. (laughs) Praise the Lord. This is what God had in mind when He established the church. See, Jesus went about preaching, teaching, miracle working, demon delivering, doing, He just did a lot of stuff. You gotta read the Gospels. But not only did He preach and teach and do the stuff, He outworked and His worship to God was done in the very midst of commitment to people. We miss this as Western individualistic thinkers, that Jesus did all of those ministry things with not just His 12 disciples, morning till evening, but also the 72, also the 500, also the crowds, is that everything, all, every part of the Christian life was done in community. The only times that weren't done in community is when He had solitude with Jesus, uh, with, with God the Father, so He could get recentered on His mission. So he could make sure that he, that he wasn't walking out of step and that there is a certain place for silence and solitude. All the, inter, uh, all the introverts said, amen. There is a certain place for those things in our life, but they need to actually empower us to then go and do the Christian life in community. We know that we're drawing people. We're a communal people. We're a family, a close family. Um, who's heard, I've preached about this before, so put your hand up. Um, Who's heard of Practicing the Presence of God? Um, beautiful little book um, based on, inspired on the life of Brother Andrew. Um, <clears throat> practicing, you've heard about practicing the presence of God, but just as much as we're called to practice the presence of God, we're called to practice the presence of people. We need to practice the presence of people. We need to be reminded of, hey, our devotional life, our quiet time keeping connected to the vine, getting all the right inputs in our life so that thing, the right things flow out of our life. But just as much we need to be focused on our inputs, staying intimately connected to Christ, the vine, but we also need to be practising the presence of people. That God's design for the maturity of the church wasn't just that we be Bible experts, it's that we be people experts. Truly, truly, read the Bible. If you're not sure, you say, we are called to be people experts. What's the, what are the, what are the greatest, what's the greatest command? Love the Lord your God, love your neighbour as yourself. Be an expert in your relationship with God. Have that going really well, but be an expert relationally as well with your neighbour, with your church family. This is a priority of God. We are to be a close family My second and what looks like will be my last point will be that we are called to be a growing family. Um, The Acts 2 church was not a perfect church. It was a diverse church. And who knows that um, when a diverse church and a growing community where people are coming from all language groups, all ethnicities, different generations, who knows that diversity often also means difficulty. It also means different preferences and practices. So we're gonna read together of one of the big speed bumps and difficulties that the early church faced in Acts chapter six. But as the the believers rapidly multiplied, did you know that God is a God of multiplication? He doesn't want us just to huddle together. He wants us, He wants to see His kingdom advance. He wants to see new people come in, in our life groups, in our churches. So think about where you sit. Are you leaving room for the person next to you? Are you so comfortable and so happy with your little life group click? This is just a generality. I'm not thinking of anyone specifically. But like God's heart is to be embracive and to grow. This is why we're a church planning movement that God wants, wants more people to come in. And this is what the early church was, but it created, who knows that a growing family means also growing pains. But as the believers 
rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings and discontent. Not in this church, no doubt. Seriously though, one of the things that can undermine family the most is a critical spirit. Can be someone who chooses to look at the negative rather than give grace and, and really, in a nutshell, operate with the spirit of love, the fruit of the spirit. Where there is no fruit of the spirit, there is division in church. There are little groupings off in church, not here. Let us not be that church that is divided. We need to be a family united, not a family divided. There were rumblings and discontent. The Greek speaking believers complained about the Hebrew speaking believers saying that their widows were being discriminated against on a racial basis against the daily distribution of food. So the 12 called a meeting and all the believers and they said, we the apostles should spend our time teaching the word, not running food programs. There was a logistical issue. And so brothers and sisters select seven men who are well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will then give them this responsibility so that it's fair and united. Then the apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching of the word. We saw that this early church community, there was division. There was racial discrimination. There were growing pains, not because they were bad people, although there was sin that was obviously in the mix, but it was like, this is what happens because we are a diverse community. When we're close together, there's gonna be stepping on each other's toes. There's gonna be different preferences. There's gonna be different beliefs. We wanna unite around the central core tr orthodox truths, salvation doctrines, but then there are other beliefs and other doctrines that are non-essentials that we need to apply charity, understanding, agree to disagree. These, this is the kind of family that we're called to be. We're gonna take communion. Um, I'll have to save my other 17 points for the next message. <laughs> um, yeah, Ashes, if you could wait upon us now as we close our time together. I love this quote. The church is not a museum for saints, but it's a hospital for sinners. The projection that we give off of how we're going with God, we need to be so careful not to be like the hypocrites that Jesus criticised so heavily. We need to take off our masks for this to be a community of openness, honesty, that I too am a sinner saved by grace. I need grace as much, much as you need grace. Even though we struggle with different things, we all struggle. So we can, we can lead with our weaknesses, not pretend to have it all together. We, this is a hospital for sinners. So as soon as we set that culture, it's a friendly pay, place to be with anyone, isn't it, Isaac? Romans 15, one to three says this. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. See, it's much each easier to, to practice a solo Christianity, a me and Jesus relationship. I don't need the church and I'm not, I know that there's people, perhaps even many people in the seats today where you've been, you've been hurt, you've been disappointed, you've been let down by church leaders, by your brothers and sisters in Christ who've, who've disappointed you greatly and I don't wanna diminish that. I think that's real and I think that's a, that's a product of sinful brothers and sisters imperfectly playing the perfect tune that, that Jesus gave us. But we are called to band together in love, to put on love, to be a family that builds each other up, not pleasing ourselves. Let us each please his neighbour for his good to build him up, for Christ did not please himself. Colossians 3, 14 says, Above all these things, put on love, which binds. What's the difference of criticism, division, separation, individualism, binding together. And that's what love does. We need love, we need the Holy Spirit which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Why don't we stand together as we hold the elements in our hands. Brothers and sisters, what, what, what unites us? The broken body, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the one Holy Spirit, regardless of our differences, regardless of our diversity and our backgrounds, we are one 
true believers, we are one in Christ. And just I wanna take us just to, as we hold the elements, I just wanna do something a bit weird, is that okay? Is that all right? Nodding your head and you're like, Sam, you haven't told us what we're gonna do. I just want us to, before we take the elements, just to look around, just right now in your seat, just have a look. Do your right and your left, but you can turn right around and take a moment. Because these are your brothers and sisters. And Jesus said, who, who are my father and my brothers, my mother and my brothers, are those who do the will of the Father. Those who have believed in Christ. You might have a fantastic biological family. You might have a dud biological family, but the good news of Jesus is that we have a spiritual family, spiritual brothers and sisters who are there to love you, care for you, lay down their life for you. And just as you do it imperfectly for others, they also do it imperfectly for you. I don't always do it right. People don't always do it right for me, but this is where we come back to Jesus. This is where we come back to, to the one loaf, which is Jesus. And we take from that same loaf. We come back, we, we come, become united. We put down our differences. We bear with one another. We love and serve one another in love. And we reunited in that pro- practice. And we just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you're our, you're our, you're our spiritual father. You're our father. We have a new identity in you. Lord, just as you laid everything on the line, just as you sacrificed everything for the church, for us, for our family, not only are we we to be thankful when we eat and drink and be reminded of that, but we're also to emulate that to one another. How do do we really know whether we get the gospel? We do the gospel with our brothers and sisters. We show love to them. We sacrifice for them. We forgive them. And so there is, as much as there is a, a blessing, there's also a challenge for us to do that together as His community today. Um, if you're not in God's family, you, the table was open. Jesus stands at the door and knocks. You can open that door. You can receive Him deep into your life. Repent, receive and believe today as you take these elements. And if you do that truly, then you'll be too a child of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's eat and drink together in His name. Let's join together in prayer. Jesus, we thank You for the sacrificial love that You demonstrated at Easter time, but You continue to demonstrate today to Your imperfect, Your flawed family of believers, our brothers and sisters. Lord, just as You loved the church so much, Lord, help us to know your love deeply for us so that it overflows out into our brothers and sisters. Lord, help us not to be stingy. Help us to be selfless. Help us to be compassionate. Help us to bear with one another, forgive one another. We know that in our own strength, when we're disconnected from You, we can't do that. So fill us afresh. Do that through us and continue to bring us to a point of maturity. In Jesus' Name, Amen.